In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. A blessed Christmas to everyone. God bless you for coming out for the Vigil Mass at this unusual hour. And I know it's hard for everyone to stay awake, but we really want to put ourselves through the mystery of our Lord's coming into the world at his birth, which was at this hour. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. That's a quote from Isaiah, uh, chapter 9. And there's several quotes from Isaiah in the same tone, speaking about darkness. And that's why it's useful that we, are, we keep our chapel in the dark uh, tonight during this vigil mass, because it shows us what kind of darkness there was in the world at the time of the coming of our Lord. And even though he's only a little baby, uh, and he's giving off light in a certain way, I'm not saying that he's shining like a light bulb or something like that, but there's a spiritual light that comes forth from this child that takes away all the darkness of the world. Dispelled is the darkness. There is no more gloom where there, wa there has just now been distress. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those who dwell, dwelt in the land of gloom, a light has shone. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing. That's the coming of our blessed Lord. Let's meditate a little bit on the silence of this night. This is the arrival of the great king, greater than ever king that ever has been or ever will be. But yet, he is born in silence. The world does not recognize this birth. The world doesn't care about this birth. Our blessed mother, Mother Mary and Joseph, they make no protest about this silence. They simply observe all these events and ponder them in their heart. Their meditation on this newborn king is the most fitting welcome to him. Better than words, better than shouts and singing, better than parades, this heart of our Blessed Mother and even this heart of St. Joseph are the best reception possible to our newborn king because they are humble, they are separated from the world, they are separated from the darkness of this world. They see the child Jesus and they understand this great light. There's some noise and there's some commotion nearby but it's nothing important. It's just the clamor of a lot of people coming together in a small city for the census. A lot of people who did not receive the parents of their king. They did not receive Mary and Joseph. These are the ones making the noise. It's the sound of the world, always so preoccupied with its interests and so far from God. That mundane and banal sound can be heard in the distance in the distance from the cave or the stable where the incarnate word has just been born. This is the most important event of all history, the coming of God into the world. And it is totally disregarded by the rest of the world when it happened. We meditate on this silence and how it is exactly what the incarnate word wants. Man cannot formulate the right words to praise God at this moment. This is the moment that God himself has been waiting for. The moment when he could come and redeem his creature, man. Man who has rejected him. But nevertheless, nevertheless, God has a great desire to take away the sin of man, lift man back up onto the level of God again by the state of grace, so that 
man can give God more and more love and praise. God is willing to make that sacrifice to bring man back to him. It is a great almost passion, uh, a great anxiety on the part of God to redeem man. There is a holy impatience on the part of God to begin this mystery of the incarnation and the life of his son on earth to end in the redemption and the resurrection. And man has no adequate words to honor it and to express his gratitude. Our Lady and St. Joseph are perfectly content to observe this greatest of all mysteries on their own in perfect silence. And this is probably the best and most appropriate honor for the newborn king. Now we meditate on the darkness of this night, but not just of this night. The darkness of this night, in fact, stands for the darkness of men's hearts. And not just tonight, but through all the nights or through all the days of history, before the coming of our Lord, up until Our Lady and St. Joseph. But I think you and I, now that many thousands or several thousands of years have passed, can also meditate on the darkness of men's hearts. We have the rejection of God by his own people, starting with his birth. And then God's people appears to change to those who were not his people. And these become the holy ones of the world. But somehow it seems like this wave, the wave has passed through this group of people also until they appear to be tired of him also. And that would be Christianity. It seems to be tired of our Lord. And we're back into the darkness again. But this child is still light, and he's light for us. Nevertheless, there begins to be the gleam of the renewal of all things in this child on this night. Just a glimmering, like your candles in this chapel right now. The light that comes forth from our Lord's crib. it starts to dispel the darkness of the centuries in which man has lived away from God. How many years man has lived in the darkness? How many years man has lived without the face of God showing itself without the presence of the redemption, and with man completely surrendered to the power of sin, since God had not come yet. But tonight, the night of Christmas, is when all of this will change. God, our Lord Jesus Christ, has come to renew all things. Man is the one who destroyed all things by his original sin and by his continuation in sin, but now our Lord will restore the order between man and God by his life and ultimately by his death on the cross. And this is the baby on this night who doesn't look very big to anyone, who in reality is quite small and apparently insignificant. He changed all this. He renewed the world. He restored man to God. He is the light. Man's sins cause darkness. This child brings God back to man. This child is God. And this ch child united man to God. All those years of darkness can be undone by this child. I was at retreat about a year ago, a year and a few months ago, and it was for priests. 
And the priest was telling an anecdote, which I had heard before, and he repeated it. It's something about a priest who got out of the habit of going to confession. That should never happen. A priest is supposed to go to confession at least once every two weeks, if not more frequently. He got out of the habit of going to confession for whatever reason, and seven years passed with no confession. A fellow priest was talking to him about this and found out about it. And the priest was so ashamed of whatever was going on in his life, even at that moment he wouldn't change and say, would you hear my confession? Why do I tell you this story? It's because this poor priest preferred to live in the darkness, in the continued darkness. The absence of God, the absence of grace, that's what the world was living in when this child came to the world, giving off light. All of this absence of God, all of this darkness is undone on this night by this child. It's not a very strong light on the night of the birth of our Lord. We still picture Darkness, midnight, the angel goes to visit the shepherds who are out in the darkness, in the cold, taking care of their sheep. But it's light, nevertheless, which comes from this child. It's even very faint as you observe the light in this church. But it is the beginning of the destruction of the kingdom of the devil and the beginning of the removing of darkness. You might have noticed that in itself, light does not come in degrees. We talk that way. We say this place has more light or that place has less light. But uh, the reality is that light is what it is. Light is light whether it's from a match or whether it's from a strong halogen lamp. I remember once I was celebrating Mass at a side altar in a church, kind of by myself before the rest of the priests came in for their morning divine office. And there was a large sort of spotlight behind my head to light up the whole altar. And I noticed while I was saying Mass that everything on the altar whether it was the missile stand or the crucifix or the candlesticks, whatever it was, they cast a strong shadow on the wall behind the altar because of the spotlight behind my head. Even I was casting a strong shadow on the wall. But the candles, I could even see uh, this sort of wavy looking floating gas casting a shadow against the wall, but the flame never casts a shadow. Now you would think with a strong lamp behind my head, shining very head on this, very hard on this candle, that that little flame would be weak compared to the bulb, the, the uh, lamp behind my head, and also would cast a shadow. But it doesn't. When light meets light, there are no degrees. This child is maybe weak and maybe he cries a little bit and he's uncomfortable and he's helpless in the sense of totally dependent on his parents. But he's already, already redeeming us by the sacrifice he's going through just being in that crib. He is light and this light is dispelling the darkness. The light is dispelling the power of Satan. It's breaking down the kingdom of Satan right now just by the presence of that child. When God created the world, he started with the most basic physical element, and that is light. On the first day, God created light. And the evening and the morning were the first day, and God was happy. Several thousand years passed, 
with man being unfaithful to God. And then after about 4,000 years, it was time for the incarnation. And light came again. But this time, not just a physical light, but a spiritual light. As the first time, God sent the first Adam who gave us physical life. But now with our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the second Adam, and he gives us supernatural life. Light is the most basic physical element, and from there all the other creatures, all the other parts of creation can be made. Light is almost uh, something spiritual. It is perceived by our, our eye, and our eyes, our eyes are the sense that is the most spiritual sense. I can perceive something with my eye, which is millions of miles away when we look at the stars up in the heavens with no real contact between here and there. It's a very spiritual sense, observing very spiritual things, light. Most basic physical element. And now on this night, the child who's going to dispel the darkness comes, and he is light. He's not just a child, he's also the renewal of man's relation to God. He is the dispelling of the darkness. He is physical light and he is spiritual light. We need him. We do not want to live in the darkness. As much as people can say that they're happy as long as they have their family, as long as they have their work, as long as they have their house, if they insist on staying in sin, they don't have the light. They don't have the child Jesus. They don't have the adult Jesus. And the darkness continues in their soul. This little baby, this incarnate word, this little king, has all the power of the most powerful light ever. Maybe at this moment he's just a candle compared to a halogen lamp. But that will soon change. He is already dispelling the darkness. The darkness. He's going to use this light to establish his kingdom here on earth. And there's nothing that the devil can do to stop that. I don't mean to close with anything too sentimental or even what might, might sound worldly. Sometimes the Christmas carols can bridge the gap between what you do in church and what you do in the shopping mall. You know, you hear Silent Night here and you hear, hear it out there. You hear a Deste Fidelis here, you hear a Deste Fidelis in the airport. And we might make the mistake of thinking, oh, I thought that was a church song. You know, what are they doing that outside here for? Well, it is a church song, but somehow it has come into our culture and uh, even in worldly atmospheres, you might hear it, but it should bring you back to the thoughts of God. So one Christmas carol, carol which is particularly impressive is O Holy Night. And there are so many references in there to the power of the light dispelling the darkness. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error, pining, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. All these references to light, and all these references to light destroying the darkness. All these references to the Son of God who comes and establishes his kingdom by pushing Satan away and putting the presence of God in people's souls. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. O oh, night divine. Why is it divine? Because the light is dispelling the darkness. O oh, night when Christ was born. O night, O holy night, O night 
divine. And there are other verses, as you know, but with the same theme. So, now that the word light has been used about 50 to 100 times in this sermon, uh, let the lesson be, I want to live for our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to live for this King. Enough of darkness in my soul. He came to renew the world. You might remember from the movie, The Passion of Christ, when there was the meeting between the Blessed Mother and our Lord, the fourth station, they shared very few words. But our Lord said something to her like, I will renew all things. Now you would think to renew all things, it would take something glorious and beautiful and clean. But in fact, what you see with the crucifixion is something apparently dirty and torturous and ugly. That's just the physical reality or the material circumstances. In fact, it is something beautiful and clean and glorious. The crucifixion. That's how he renews all things. That's how he puts the kingdom of Satan to death, by taking on himself the price, the, 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 the weight and the payment of all of our sins. But that begins already on this night. That child wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's already winning his battle against the devil. And in as much as he's doing that, he's already light. And he's already renewing the world. The lesson for us is, don't let us stay in darkness. I know this chapel is a little bit dark right now, but your candles are dispelling that darkness. That's what our souls should do, along with the soul of our divine Lord, who did it first. That's the reality. That's what Mother Mary and St. Joseph saw in this night. This child is renewing everything, starting now. Sure, the shepherds came. Our Blessed Mother was very happy to receive them, the first adorers. Eventually, the Magi would come. Same thing. But the essential for Our Lady is this child, whether the world recognizes him or not, he is dispelling the darkness. And he can dispel the darkness. The Blessed Mother has no darkness in her soul, but he can dispel the darkness in any man's soul. That's the mystery. Don't let us mix it with the world in such a way that we empty out our Lord Jesus Christ of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we see happening with his church nowadays. They say things that are really the maxims of the world, but they try to say with Christian words or Christian language. No, our Lord Jesus Christ dispels darkness. He sees the devil, he sees sin, he pays the sacrifice for it with his life. That's the light dispelling the, dark, dispelling the darkness. Let him do that in the soul of every one of us, especially at this time of Christmas, but throughout our, whole, throughout our whole life as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.